Hi, my name is Isaac Christofferson. I'm an architect at, at Missouri. So today we're going to talk about, um, so how many people were here last night and saw the JBoss keynote presentation where they did the OpenStack OpenShift? It's pretty cool where they sat there and deployed OpenShift up on top of OpenStack and then deployed the applications there. So I hate to disappoint you, I don't have anything that cool to show from that deployment. But what I do have to show today, we're going to talk about a little bit about OpenShift, talk about the reasons why the PaaS works for your development lifecycle in your environment, we're going to talk about some ways to deploy your applications within OpenShift. We're also going to actually deploy OpenShift on multiple cloud providers and show, or show, it, show it deployed to multiple cloud providers, because I don't I only have an hour, I can't take all of them. And then what we're going to go ahead and see is we're going to see an application that we have running on all of the, on three or four of them. And we'll be able to um, submit input on one app provider and see it replicate on the app other applications throughout there. So we'll get a little game for you guys to play as you guys uh, go for the score here. Um, so I work for Missouri. Uh, we're a Java E open source provider. Uh, we have a booth out here at Summit. We've been doing Red at Summit for a number of years, um, doing JBoss work 10 plus years. We're a premier partner, been middleware partner of the year. We've won a couple of innovation awards. And so we've been playing a lot with Red Hat Technologies as open source for a while. So I really like the OpenShift platform because it brings together a lot of stuff that we play with and a lot of stuff that we do um, as far as with JBoss technologies and then other applications as Ruby, Python, Node.js, all those out there, as well as uh, services to uh, push up your applications. And one of the reasons why, for, one of the reasons for OpenShift is today we sort of have a challenge, right? It, with, the, of, with the advent of the cloud and the virtualization, we have more and more pressure to sort of deliver the applications faster, right? And there's always a constant demand for new services. That means there's more IT resources that we need. Uh, there, and we need to be able to um, push out new features. I mean, there are some people, some of the companies out there, such as Netflix, which will push 30 releases a day, right? So 30 releases of your code pushed out to your environment, production environment, a day, right? So how do we get to that? How do we accelerate our and standardize the developer workflows to get us to that point? So just as background, so from cloud, and we've heard a lot, if you've gone to a lot of different sessions, whether it be OpenStack or OpenShift and some of those other out, uh, cloud forms, we sort of look at the different models of delivery for that one, right? So we have the infrastructure as a service, and that's your traditional plays like Amazon, Google Compute Engine, um, OpenStack comes into that play. And then we start to have your, your platform as a service play, so the Heroku, the OpenShift, the, the Cloud Foundry. And we start getting into the SaaS environments where we're pulling on Salesforce and those uh, technologies on there. So the further lower down we get in the stack over all to my right over here with the infrastructure as a service, the more that we have to do to bring that environment up, right? And we don't, when we don't have infrastructure in a service and we have just virtualization over there, we have to do a lot to spin up those machines. And when we don't have virtualization, we have to do a lot to spin up the physical infrastructure, right? So the less automation that we have, the more control that we have, but we also have more responsibility, right? So the automation, what we need to do is um, standardize, because you can't really automate something that doesn't have a standard process, and then begin to orchestrate how those, uh, uh, how we would go ahead and deploy uh, services across the, these layers, right? So you may have seen this slide from other presentations from the OpenShift. The old way of pushing applications in development, right? So I've come from the Washington, D.C. area. I've worked a lot of government contracts. Um, you go over on the physical side. How do you go out and build it? Well, you have an idea and you go do it. You got to go get money. Then you got to go get the hardware. Then you got to go wait for hardware to come in. And then you got to go get more hardware and rack and stack it and install it and get the, everything up and running. So you go through all these steps in 20 of them. And if you're working with a lot of government Contracts, there's a lot more bureaucracy in there as well, and so are the larger enterprises. So then, you know, sort of early 2000s, late 90s, virtualization really starts to creep in, and now we can provision out servers faster, right? It now doesn't take three months to get a hardware out there. It only takes three weeks. All right, that's better. But really what we want is all the way over here to my left, with, we want that assembly line, right? I have an idea for an app. I just need to get money so I can start developing on it, and I just want to start writing it testing it and releasing it, right? So if I can reduce all these 20 or so steps over here down to these six and get streamlined that process, uh, innovation flows faster. 
right? So this is the case for a platform as a service for your developers, right? So I can go ahead and just developers can just concentrate on coding, deploying it, and running their applications. And they can go through this cycle multiple times, and the iteration happens faster, uh, more efficient, because we're doing everything with reduced steps since we've standardized on those processes. We can run through them faster. Um, and then the scalability, right? So now we have a way to scale easily because we have an automated, standardized approach to how we're going to release our application. So when we need to add more servers to it, we have a standard set of procedures to do that, we, to take those server procedures to build out a new instance and turn up the application and stuff and running. But still, um, with, with this, with the platform as a service play, we, we still sort of need, um, we, we still sort of need one other thing here, and that is we need to make sure that we are agnostic to the infrastructure. So I mean, a lot of time, and my role as a developer at times, and someone comes up and says, what sort of hardware do you need? And I says, well, I just need something to run my JBoss application server. I don't care, right? I don't care if it's a Windows box. Well, maybe I do. Um, I need a Linux server. That's fine. Or I, I, don't, I shouldn't tell you how many, worry about how many CPUs and stuff. I just need to know that my application can run in this container. And, you as, and the operations or the system administrators should be able to have the most options available to them to deliver that to me, right? So the more we put out there. So the best way to get the best choice and make sure that we use the resources the best way is to make sure that that platform, the service layer, is truly agnostic of our infrastructure. Right? So we only really need, we don't care if it's physical. If I want to carve up a big box and a lot of small boxes on there, that's, I should be able to do that. I don't really want to do virtualization if I don't have to. Maybe I, I do do that and we standardize all on VMware or KVM and Rev. Um, if I want to run my own little private cloud infrastructure out there, so I've got OpenStack on there, it should be an option, right? And if I want to go out and then use Amazon or Google or DigitalOcean, I should be able to do that, right? I should not be limited. The choice uh, is important to me, right? So we want that free as a freedom approach here. And then, of course, the other thing developers want with platform as a service, right? We don't care about the infrastructure. The operation system administrators do but the operations system administrators don't care about this rich ecosystem of frameworks that we have, right? Unless, of course, it's your job to install all of them, and then you just, you just care. But if I want to be able to use my developer tools, I should, as a developer, I should be able to use the toolkit I have available to me, the ones I'm most comfortable with. So with Eclipse, Maven, I can use whatever packaged apps. If I'm using Drupal shop, I should be able to put those in my platform area. Uh, frameworks, right? So Java, Python, we start getting into languages here. So Python, Java, PHP, Node, Ruby, right? One platform that I can deploy as a service to support all of these languages, right? So the whole true polyglot approach where operations guys have one platform to manage, developers have a rich choice about what they can use, and it's simplified, right? Because we standardize our platform, we standardize our processes. And then, of course, with OpenShift, we have the concept of custom cartridges, which are basically pre-built frameworks that we can add on and augment our system. And then we can start to pull in other aspects about where we'll go um, as far as the middleware choices and the database stores that we're using. Okay. So we're going to look at sort of the multiple perspectives that are in here, right? So as I said, we want the free as in freedom, right? We want our choice of how we interface with our tooling, right? If I want to use Eclipse, if I want to go ahead and use a web browser, if I want to use an, uh, an IDE, if I want to do everything just straight from the command line or from a mobile app, um, we can all do that with OpenShift. So I have, the developers have that ability. Choice of middleware, if I want to do Java EE6 and JBoss or a Tomcat server, I can do that. Ruby, Node, JS, PHP, we can do that. And we're talking about your choice of cloud here, right, which is where this, this concept of this talk is about PaaS anywhere. So I can go ahead and deploy um, in public, private, and even hybrid environments where I can deploy my application across both private and public and really across providers if they have that. We need some administrative tools, right? So the ops guys, of course, are going to stand this up, but we need to make sure that we understand what's going on in that environment, right? So ways to manage. So we've allocated um, resources to, an uh, to people's a pool of like uh, containers where they can deploy the applications need to be able to understand how much they're consuming. Okay. 
right? So we have all of those offering out there, and we build out those platform as a service play. So just as a sort of little bit of history, um, if you're not familiar with OpenShift, you can go out and start up an account today. Go to openshift.com. OpenShift Online's out there. It's been around you know, early 2001. Uh, create an account, you'll get three gears to be able to deploy your applications into. And to go ahead and do that is as simple as going up, doing a um, creating application, uh, going to our HC app, creating these are the command line tools. What I'm going to go ahead and show here in a second is actually creating an application. I'm going to go through the web portal browser here, pivot to, towards that. But what's happening in these steps here, I've created an application. So I've said, let me go ahead and create a JBoss application. Let me go ahead and add a Mongo database to my back end. I already have my ear that I want to deploy, so I can just go copy it and push it to my deployments so I can upload my application there. I add it to Git and I push it, and I'll instantly, magically, the application is going to get deployed out into online. Right? So when we talked about it way back in the early slide, to be able to get to those six steps or those simplified steps, these steps right here, I can have an application running in the environment. So that's one way from the command line tool. What I'm going to go ahead and do, so this is openshift.com. Go ahead and log in with my account. I work with my trusty Wi Fi. So when we're going to log in, it's going to take me into my main console here, right? So I've got a couple of apps on here. Um, you can sort of see what I was working on for the demo here. Uh, so I got four different apps, and they're all Node.js type of applications here. So it's easy to um, display. I've got up to like 16 cartridges available, 16 different applications I can deploy with my account here. And for me to go ahead and add an application to the web console, I'm just go into web add, ec, uh, add uh, application here. And I, there's a series of quick start applications, so I can go ahead and pick up like own cloud, which is a sort of a Dropbox solution. Um, it's, I picked this one because it's the one I presented at Summit last year. And so we can go ahead and slick that as a quick start. Um, so what are the things out here? We're going to give it a name. So I call it own cloud, and then everything off to the uh, left of that. Uh, to my left of that is the Visuri Paz at rhcloud.com. That's going to be the provisioned URL that's put out there. It's going to give us a Git source code repository where we can go ahead and modify the code after the fact. Gear size is small, so um, there's very um, allocation, with those that correlate to how much disk space, how much memory and RAM that I'm allocating towards my application. Uh, the cartridges is part of this thing. So this is an own cloud application, but it's a PHP application that uses MySQL and the, the cron. And then scaling um, can basically, if we get a large load of web traffic, we can actually replicate it. But we're not going to do the scaling for this one. So then creating it is, I've got all these choices. I've entered this information. I go ahead and create, a, create application. And it will spin. And so what happens on this in the background for this one is it goes ahead and provisions out the DNS that we just specified here. Then it'll go out there and sort of find a host or a node to host my application. It'll then go out and provision my application in that space, take the source, re get recode, uh, source code get repository from there that's going to use to seed my application, and then it'll provision it, bring it back up, and then uh, once it's up and running, that URL will be operational. So it'll, this is actually another implementation of, of um, OpenShift that we have deployed. If you guys work anywhere within the federal government, this is an autonomic resources OpenShift implementation. So I've deployed the same sort of process in the own cloud. It 
so it'll start to log in for that. So what do we have here in this situation where we're at right now? We have OpenShift Online. It's running in Amazon's uh, US East for that application. I also have another instance of OpenShift running out in uh, autonomic resources data centers that are specific for uh, FedRAMP certifications to meet the criteria for running government applications. Same, uh, same sort of open, same OpenShift applications deployed out there. So now I can start to look at the story of being able to deploy in multiple environments. So the next piece of this one, so we got OpenShift Online, which did a little bit of sneak peek of deploying to another OpenShift environment, is OpenShift Origin. So just as Fedora is to RHEL, being OpenShift Origin is the upstream for OpenShift Enterprise, which we'll talk about here in a second. What this OpenShift Origin will allow us to do is we'll be able to deploy uh, open source bits into uh, our environment, deploy it on Fedora, deploy it on CentOS, deploy it on Scientific Linux, Basically, any SE Linux compliant OS that can also support C groups, container partitioning, those are really the main criteria for that. And so we we'll demo create, you can do the same sort of demo about creating an application in an OpenShift origin instance where you do an RC create app. Um, same sort of command line. The only reason why I'm repeating this one is to point out the fact that what we're deploying out there in OpenShift online, and the same way we deployed from there is the same process that I would go deploy to an OpenShift origin. Same tool, I've just changed my environment from there. So go ahead and show a, um, I lost my, there it is. another environment where we have OpenShift deployed. Um, it's a self-signed cert as I went ahead and deployed this one. So we have this environment here. So anyone know what cloudapp.net is? It's Microsoft Azure. So this is OpenShift deployed in Azure. So I have OpenShift Origin sitting there deployed. I have a little vote app sitting out there. So now I can deploy. So I've looked at deploying in ArcWorks. I've looked at deploying in, using the OpenShift Online. And I've got Microsoft Azure sitting there deploying for this environment. So what I'll show here, we'll go ahead and So what I've got done on here is I've created an OpenShift Azure account. There's a, uh, I'm going to go ahead and log into the OpenShift instance, that I've uh, the VM that I create out there that's pre-OpenShift. I'm going to go ahead and uh, set up the root access. And I'm going to use the OO install tool that's out there to go ahead and deploy OpenShift in, in this environment. So a couple of things I want to set up here for this demo as I was basically setting up the host name that I'm going to use. So I have paths at Azure at OSS Hive. This will come in, in handy here in a few minutes when we get to seeing a demo application on here. Um, we're going to go ahead and make sure we set up the network information inside of there. And we'll go ahead and install some um, network pack, uh, go and install some software. So it's a cheat sheet over here on the uh, next to the terminal window is pretty much the steps that I went through to go ahead and do this one. Um, there's, I used an older version for the origin because I knew I could get this to work. Um, there's some things I had to pull into this uh, open, uh, what this is, this is a CentOS image running up there in Windows Azure. And what I pulled in was the, uh, some Ruby libraries and get, brought in Apple, did some updates for patching for this one. Let's fast forward a little bit here.
because what I want to get to and show here is this point here. So now we're, at, we're getting to the next point here where I'm enabling Ruby 193 here, and I'm now going to go ahead and get to the point where uh, the last step, which, which is going to be the most important, so we're doing all this prep work, this plumbing work to get up and running so we can do OpenShift, uh, the O install tool. And then when we run this, there's an app, so you can go to install.openshift.com. And now we'll go through a, a sort of questionnaire, right? So ask us, we want to install OpenShift Origin. Tell me what, what's my OpenShift deployment environment I'm go, going to do this for. So I'm calling my domain azure.osshive.io. Uh, yes, it's going to, we're going to manage the DNS for this one. So we'll ask a short, short set of questionnaires for these steps. And then um, after we're done with those steps, uh, after this questionnaire, it's just going to go through and do the insta installation. And so when all comes up, after the fact, what we showed a little bit earlier, as far as the um, fazuripaz.cloudapp.net, you'll be able to see the, uh, this is how that was built. So I'll just get to the last piece here. Because the one thing that you'll do once you kick off the OO install is there's a lot of packages that get installed. There's a lot of uh, configurations that get installed. So then what you'll, be, you'll do is pretty much kick it off, which is why I installed screen in the first place, and then walk away and then come back 10 minutes later, depending upon network connection. So here we're just assigning the IP address that we're gonna use for the DNS resolution. So OpenShift, part of this install process, there's a couple, couple of components here of the OpenShift. Um, I, I didn't go into the details too much of the, how, what it makes all the libraries and components of there. But DNS, ActiveMQ, um, Mongo, very important components for the database. So we're, we're trying here to set up the, the piece, uh, setting up the uh, DNS names for this one. And then this is the uh, repository that I was using to pull out, so release three, OpenShift. And since this was um, a CentOS one, I pulled out of the RHEL 6 repository that's sitting out there public. Um, so we'll go ahead and get the install release going on that six. And then what we'll see, finish out the questionnaires as far as the repositories go. We'll just confirm our, our settings. And then Next thing that happens is validate to check if there's some packages that we need. So I think what I have to go through here, these steps then is go through and add in some other libraries as far as Agios and some of the other ones out there. So I won't put you through watching most of these screens here. Um, I do have this up there on a YouTube video if you wanna watch through that as, as, as some of the installs out there. But really some of the um, steps that we're, it's really automating going through and installing all these packages. And um, so this will be the same process and the same sort of tool that comes in very handy uh, so I use this process to go ahead and install OpenShift on DigitalOcean, on Azure, Rackspace, um, and AWS instances from there. And the tool comes in so it will install both Origin and, op and if you have the entitlements for it, OpenShift Enterprise. You can use the same process tool for doing that. If you don't want to go through all that install, and I'm going to mention this with a caveat, there is an OVA image available out there. So if you go to um, openshift.github.io, there's an image that you can download and import into your VirtualBox instance or your VMware instance or KVM. Let's import that image out there. It's pre-built. 
They're not available today. I think they're sort of pulled down for um, recent sort of heart bleed security or whatever the recent is out there. There's some security vulnerability. But they'll be back up there shortly. But if you go up to um, openshift.github.io, you'll get a, an image to get started. So download the image, get it up and running. So much faster way to go than trying to install it from scratch with all the RPMs, just um, another option that's available. So then that, so that's OpenShift Origin. Can I go back to that? The last piece in the puzzle here is OpenShift Enterprise, all right? So just as Fedora will package up and all the upstream products will come in, we have a enterprise supported offering out there to deploy into your own data center. And so that would be the OpenShift Enterprise components. Um, obviously, the upstream open source one is more, is, features go into it faster, and then they trickle down as they're hardened and, and secured. Um, but in general, the same sort of command line tools usually work across the board for all of them. The only exception to that one is when there's a new feature that's been added. And so this one's a little bit different, but, we, uh, but the one example I'd shown before with the Java app would still apply. So then it's an RHC app create for this one. This one particular one, we did a Node.js. And we're going to actually see this application here pretty soon. Um, I have a GitHub repo where I pushed sort of my example app up there. I think that's the URL out there. And then this app is using Mongo. So one of the neat uh, advantages with OpenShift in the past is the partner ecosystem it has that's growing. Uh, there's a partner out there called Mongo Lab. If you use MongoDB and you want database as a service, that's what they do. So I'm actually leveraging that service so everyone's talking to their database instance. Um, the configuring the Mongo Lab instance, once I've created my in out there, I will go ahead and set an environment variable and then use that. And then there's an app for that component. And of course, I just, we just sort of went over this before, but here's the install at openshift.com. So I went through the steps of doing the OO install. Uh, you, you go to here. It's pretty much all the steps we kind of walk through with the, the video. And if you don't want to use the uh, OO install tool, there's also a rich documentation here, so you can go ahead and do it manually. Uh, if, I would recommend going through and doing it manually once so you get a good appreciation for all the components that are integrated here to work. But once you've got a script and a good tool, it, um, I would continue to use that. So with all these tools that we have here, right, and so the concept for, for PaaS Anywhere, we, we have the ability to run OpenShift and OpenShift Online. We have the ability to use OpenShift Origin. I can deploy it on CentOS. I can deploy it in Fedora, right? And so most all of these cloud providers support CentOS or Fedora, right? So DigitalOcean, not every cloud provider out there right now supports RHEL, right? So like DigitalOcean doesn't really have RHEL instances out there. Google just recently made theirs public out there. So sometimes you need another option if you want to deploy the OpenShift environment, and so you can sort of go across the operating systems. But once we have, with those tools, with OO install, with the OpenShift Origin, and with OpenShift Enterprise, and with OpenShift Online, we have a lot of op options to go ahead and deploy. We're not limited now to our infrastructure, right? We are truly infrastructure agnostic. I don't care if it's bare metal. I don't care if it's virtual machines. I don't care if which cloud provider it is. I just need SE Linux compliant OS, and I need C groups. And then I can go ahead and begin to deploy some of these applications here. And you can also take advantage of some other, advantage, uh, some other components out there. We can, uh, Puppet Labs actually, uh, the Puppet's recipes are which driving behind the scenes for the OO install, so there's those out there. We've got clients that we've worked with that have done it with Ansible. You can certainly just use your own bash script to go ahead and install it. And then there's OpenStack, right? So I mentioned at the beginning where we did the, the uh, when they did the JBoss keynote last night, and they deployed OpenStack and they used heat templates, right? So heat templates is the definition to do that. Um, some other, it's a thing built specifically for OpenStack. Some other tools out there we can go ahead and use, um, open source ones. So Packer and Vagrant are great DevOps tools right now as far as provisioning out there. So with Packer and Vagrant, I can, or let's say with Vagrant, I can target my providers. And if I have a good set of Puppet scripts or Ansible scripts, I can go ahead and now configure and push those environments out there. And so now I can sort of pivot to whichever provider is best for me. Right? 
So this is what we're talking about. Well, choose your desired infrastructure, right? OpenShift is built on instances of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, okay, or CentOS, what we were using for this one. And everything underneath that, in that bottom period, AWS, so I can use cloud forms, I can use OpenStack, I can use Rev, I can be bare metal, VMware. I don't care what the infrastructure is. We're infrastructure agnostic, and because I'm now infrastructure agnostic, the ability for me to deploy paths anywhere becomes e easier, right? So now it's, I don't have to worry so much about how to procure hardware and how to procure uh, cloud instances. I can just find the first one that can answer to me. So with that, we get to the idea of realizing open hybrid paths, right? So open hybrid, uh, what does that mean? Well, we want to be able to open source, right? And we want to be able to spread ourselves outside our data center and public clouds across cloud providers, right? So that's what we want to go ahead and do is to realize that concept of open hybrid paths. So then we have the ability now to choose your favorite cloud provider. If you do a lot of federal government work, autonomic resources, the cloud platform, maybe use Amazon resource, uh, web services, Windows Azure, as we just sort of showed here, Rackspace, Google Compute Engine, DigitalOcean, really, as long as I can get up an instance of running, get into a Linux instance, I can go ahead and deploy that. So here comes the fun part. So I have an application, um, except for the first one, I have credential access problem right now, but I have an application deployed out there at Amazon Azure, DigitalOcean, uh, um, OpenShift Online, and Rackspace. Same application deployed with all of it. What we'll go ahead and see is you can go to votevisory.com and navigate to one of these, or go to one of those URLs to get to, to that endpoint. And then whatever, what it will allow you to do is to vote for your favorite cloud provider. What is your cloud provider of choice? And the score will be updated across whichever browser that we're using for that. And we did do some work to try and make this a little mobile friendly so it'll work on your phones as well. So we got the cloud provider battery royale here, right? So we listed a bunch of providers. If I don't have anything in a provider out there that's your favorite one, I welcome you to add it. So we can just go ahead and add. add new kid on the block from there. Um, so it's there. And then what we can go ahead and also do is look at that same application being deployed out here at DigitalOcean, right? So if you guys are looking at the votevisory.com, which I'm running, hosting at OpenShift Online, what you'll see is the vote tally being synchronized and over to here as well, right? So what do we have with this one? What does this give us, right? I have a application, the same application code deployed across OpenShift origin instances, deployed across OpenShift enterprise instances, right? Because I had to make that uh, trade-off because I couldn't deploy uh, OpenShift enterprise into Dig DigitalOcean because they don't have a RHEL instance on there for me to add that. I was able to also straddle cloud providers. So I'm seeing the same application, um, straddle cloud providers. So with, by seeing the same application, uh, there are those results are now synced up. So if for whatever reason Amazon goes out, my application is still over here running in DigitalOcean or Rackspace or from that standpoint. Right? Behind the scenes driving this one, I am using Mongo Lab, so I have a Mongo instance this one. If you're familiar with Mongo, we could take, we, I did a simple install, but there's no reason why we couldn't set up a, a sort of a, a shard and replication across providers as well to sort of build that resiliency on these. And I don't think we'll be able to join in enough load on this one, but one of the other features that's inherent in OpenShift is its dynamic scaling aspects. So I can just say, deploy this application, say, I want it to be scalable. 
So if I get a huge amount of requests out there, what we'll OpenShift will do is take the, the code base I've got for this one, copy it, spin up another instance, register it with a proxy server, and then the endpoints you hit there is fine. Now I've got extra workers to distribute the load on there. So it looks like there's a lot of people that are fans of OpenShift Online. Um, So they're out there. So just as a, a plug for us, so we're, we've been doing uh, OpenShift from the early days. Um, big fans of it, like I said, because of the flexibility that we have. Um, we can certainly help, if you're looking interested in this, we can certainly help get it into your environment quickly. Um, and as I said, we just demoed it here, just showing it across all the different environments with the different providers out there. And we'll also sit there and help migrate some of your applications into there. Um, help you identify which are the best candidates for that one. Thanks, guys, and have a good uh, rest of the summer.